Okay. Hi everyone, Zoe here. I am the social media manager for Our Daily Planet and I am joined by Monica and Miro this time to talk to them about some of the election results and what they hope to see moving forward regarding climate change. Thanks for doing this, Zoe. We're, you know, excited. There's a lot we don't know and some things that we do know. So I think that's an important dive to have. Yeah, so let's dive in. Yeah, absolutely. So I kind of wanted to start off the interview with Paul positivity. So aside from the presidential race, what are some bright spots in the results so far that are notable? I think kind of the big ones for me are the two Senate wins Dems had with seats they picked up. So Cory Gardner lost his race for Colorado's Senate seat and former Governor John Hickenlooper won. And Hickenlooper has been supporter of climate change. I think he'll be a really interesting voice from a Western state on climate issues, especially, you know, we've seen the devastating wildfires Colorado has experienced this year. We've seen the ongoing drought in the Rockies. It's a state at the very forefront. And I think that'll be a really important voice to have in the Senate. Likewise, Mark Kelly, who is an astronaut and husband of former Congresswoman Gabby Giffords won his race in the Arizona Senate race. And, you know, again, I think this is another Western state that is experiencing extreme heat that's becoming unlivable for people. There are drought issues, and that's going to be an important voice in the Senate because Mark Kelly, I mean, Arizona is kind of a purplish state now. I don't think it's solidly blue or maybe even light blue, time will tell. But, you know, he's really great at talking about these issues in a nonpartisan way, explaining why they matter to all people in Arizona and from his state. So I'm really excited to have both of them in the Senate and to have their perspective. Excited about some of the state and local races that yeah. went our way on climate. There was a great ballot initiative in Nevada that requires renewable energy purchases. And that's the kind of thing in 2016 and 2018 that we may have struggled with, but this time we got over the hump on that. I also think there was a great local race in Denver where they increased the sales tax in Denver in order to pay for climate initiatives, which is awesome. They're going to build parks and do some things to help with water management. They also have two new water management districts in Colorado, which is so important for how much they'll have for drinking water and how they can work out between farmers and the cities how to allocate the water that they have. There are several great parks initiatives in Eastern cities. One thing that we should take from this is that people at the local level really care about climate change and maybe care enough to pay more in taxes or to see some of their green space increased. That's really awesome. And I think it's really encouraging to hear that there are so many people at the local level and the grassroots level coming through, especially in this election and so many more diverse voices, especially in terms of female and LGBTQ candidates who are now in office. So it's very exciting to kind of pivot to something a little bit more not positive. What about some races that didn't bode well for climate candidates? Yeah, I mean, I think the two that really stand up for me were, and again, Florida. Come on, Florida. <laughs> You're ground zero for climate change. Like, please vote for climate candidates. So Debbie McCarrisel Powell, who is a first term congresswoman, and Donna Shalala of Miami, both Democrats, both lost their seats to Republicans. And this is truly ground zero in ground zero in Florida and South Florida for climate issues. And so, you know, that that's kind of tough for climate action. Democrats still held the majority in the House. You know, we saw that McCarrisel Powell won in 2018 and a Republican, Carlos Crabello, lost, who he was good on climate issues. He never denied climate change. If I remember correctly, he even addressed this in a campaign ad that he had in 2018. He, he was a favor. He was in favor of a carbon tax. He had a proposal. yeah, yeah. But that's tough because I don't think any Republican is going to be super ahead of where their party stands and going to push the party on legislation that's needed at the scale that we need it. So that's a tough loss. I mean, I think TBD, we'll see, but it just, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of bipartisanship on this issue. And those are kind of two unfortunate seats to lose. Mm -hmm. I think we're going to have to learn how to be bipartisan on this issue. That's really the takeaway for me from the loss of the seats in the Senate races that we were really hoping to pick up and a couple of House races where we lost good Democratic candidates who would have been reliable votes on climate. I think we have to think hard about how to do things in a way that will expand our group of members of Congress who care about these issues. And, you know, like Miro was saying, some of them are ground zero for climate change. So we've really got to find a way to extend that hand out and figure out 
you know, what can we work together on? It'll be crucial to get things done. Like we don't have time not to get things done. And I think it's a shame that we weren't able to defend some of our climate policies because they were labeled or branded as socialism when that's really not what they are. They're jobs. And I think Joe Biden did a great job of trying to turn that argument around, but we're going to have to keep working on it because they are jobs. I mean, the truth is they really are all about jobs and it's not just energy jobs. There are a lot of jobs in transportation and in restoration and um, infrastructure, manufacturing. There's going to be new jobs because this is where industry is going. And so we really need to capitalize on that somehow. We need to bring businesses in. We need to keep working at the state and local level, cut across party lines and find common ground. And that's going to be hard because I think a lot of the people who are frustrated right now are the people who were most hoping that we would have this blue wave. And so we need to figure out how to bring those people around and reach across and try to work in a bipartisan way to get as much done as we can as fast as we can. I have one more point to make on that in terms of messaging. And my hope is that maybe we get more celebrities and sports stars to start talking about this. My one idea is that I know Dwayne Wade has a lot of causes. He champions and him and his wife are fantastic. I would love for him to be a voice for climate action in Florida, you know, like Wayne County. Why not? Like it's really at risk and maybe he can be the climate ambassador we need. So D Wade, if you're listening to this, uh, <laughs> we, ha- we have another job for you if you want it. Maybe we can give him a call. Yeah, Yeah, exactly. Tweet this out at him. The common thread definitely, like you both said, for a number of these questions is bipartisanship. But what do you think a Republican Senate will mean for the Biden administration? I think they will have their work cut out for them in trying to do what they can. We have huge problems with the pandemic and needing to get people relief now. And so I think, you know, it will be hard to find room for climate in the agenda in Congress. But that just means that they have to be more resourceful, that the Biden team has to look hard for funding sources, for ways to to leverage the things that they have, like potentially the defense spending bill, if they could use the government's purchasing power. We are going to buy automobiles anyway for the government. Why not buy electric vehicles? Why not, as we get new office space for government agencies, make sure that it's climate ready? There are ways to use power the government has without having to ask permission from Congress. One of my favorites is climate services, is helping people to adapt to climate change. That's something everyone can agree on. In fact, it's pretty bipartisan. And if we could work harder on on helping state and local agencies and businesses get prepared for climate, that would be awesome. But Monica, do you think that's going to take the purse strings of Congress to accomplish? Or can we reshuffle money? Is it going to take declaring climate change a national emergency by the president? I think they're going to have to be resourceful and see there definitely will be climate disasters. As we can tell, I mean, Hurricane Zeta is coming back and it's going to hit Florida as a tropical storm or beta. I'm sorry, we're beyond Zeta. It's beta that's going to come back and hit Florida as a tropical storm, I think Congress will be confronted with these things. And the question is, can we take advantage of disasters, which is a terrible thing to say, but that's a time when Congress may be willing to do some things like that. And there's plenty of authority in the government to actually start creating those services. There's um, the National Weather Service and FEMA and lots of other agencies are already doing it, but not in as organized a way as they could be with just the right president directing that to happen. Yeah. So I want to loop it back around to the Senate. And I think that we should also, you know, while doing all these things Monica mentioned, keep our eyes on 2022, because that that map looks a little bit better for Democrats. And we're going to see Republicans retiring in Pennsylvania and North Carolina, potentially with Chuck Grassley in Iowa, like he's hinted at it. (laughs) He's you know, getting getting up there in age. And those are three states that are really kind of on the front lines of the energy transition. So we have wind in Iowa, we have solar in North Carolina, and Pennsylvania is a state that is really seeing a transition from coal to what's next. And I think that a lot of the workers there are going to be the ones that we really need in the clean energy transition. And so I think that is a a state to watch and we'll see how Democrats might make the pitch to um, 
Pennsylvania voters. You know, we're still waiting as, as of this moment, recording on Thursday afternoon to see what's happening in Pennsylvania. But again, that's a, that's a swing state. And I think two years we'll have to focus and strategize about how we can ensure that climate candidates win in those states. Do you think that in these states where their elected officials are up for re-election in 22, that it provides an opening for younger and fresher voices in this sphere? I mean, we have people like Ilhan Omar and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez who have kind of broken through. What do you, what do you think about about the future of yeah I don't want to necessarily pin it on age I think we need the right candidates for the right races and that you know might be someone younger in one state and that might be someone that is really well known across the state and respected and name ID so I think that's tough to say I think we need candidates who are committed to solving climate change at the scale that we need but also understand the communities that they're coming from. So, you know, I don't want to pigeonhole ourselves too much here, but yeah. yeah we got a shout out to friend of the planet, Ed Markey, Senator Ed yes. Markey, who was, oh, yeah, we love him. Who was running strong and against a much younger opponent, but because of his climate stance, he really got helped by a lot of young people. I think we need young people to get involved in these races. If that's running for them or running for down ballot offices, that's really important. I also think putting pressure on a lot of the members who are up, like Senator Rubio from Florida is up for re-election in 2022. And he's someone who should really be heard from on these issues from young people in Florida who could really shape that race by putting pressure on him. Spoiler but- alert, his answers have been really lackluster and they really suck. And it's like, you're the senator from Florida. Come on, man. <laughs> yeah, climate ground zero for climate yeah. change. He ought to be held accountable for some of the things that, you know, will be up for discussion during the campaign. These campaigns are an opportunity to push the issue farther. It's like what we've seen. I know it may be discouraging that we didn't make more progress in Texas, but that's another place where we really need to push harder for climate change to be an issue on the ballot in every single election. So if Joe Biden is to win Arizona, it's going to be the first time that the state has been blue in 24 years. What do you think this potential flip in both the Senate and the presidential races might mean for climate change and environmental policy in that region? I said this before, but I just think that we need more awareness about how bad it is. I mean, you're having days that are pushing into 110, 113 degrees, and these are sustained weeks on end, hot days, and people can't live like that. And I don't, I don't know why we're dragging our feet on this. It's you know com- completely unsustainable. And finally, we have voices coming from Arizona in the Senate that can talk about this. And it's so needed because Martha McSally isn't talking about it. I mean, like she, when asked about these questions, she just runs away from them entirely. And that's unacceptable. I think there's an opportunity for the use of some of the executive power in those states. If Joe Biden is to win, there's large military installations in Arizona and developing solar energy or renewable energy for those installations is another way that we could have some breakthroughs. And the Colorado River Water Compact is another area where the federal government can take action without necessarily involving Congress, but can lead the way in helping to develop water sharing agreements that are more sustainable because you know, water is going to be critical in those the southwestern border states. So now for something completely different, we can anticipate many lawsuits and pleads for recounts from Trump and his team, some of which we're already seeing. I know, Monica, you have a lot of experience with this, but the last time a presidential race felt and was this contentious was with Bush and Gore in 2000. What sort of similarities and differences are you seeing between that election and this one? Well, I'll tell you that the differences are tremendous. And I think as much as the president is trying to call into question the election, this time poll workers have stood up and said, we're going to count these ballots. They haven't been intimidated by some of the people standing outside of the polls, trying to force them to either stop counting or start counting, count faster. They are really the guardians of our democracy. And I know a lot of people have thanked them. And I think we all feel a debt of gratitude for them um, because they're holding not only the election, but you know these climate outcomes in 
their hands. And really, that is a huge testament to, I think, the lessons we learned in 2000. Yes, we stopped (laughs) counting the votes because of voter intimidation and poll worker intimidation and electoral judge intimidation and excessive litigation to stop counting. This time we are working hard and people recognize the importance of counting every vote. And to me, that feels like a big momentous change, a thing that we learned from that 2000 race. What's the same is the waiting and the long drawn out time. You know, that was weeks of uncertainty that was really difficult for the country to withstand. And I hope that we have an answer soon. And I'm optimistic that Joe Biden will win. But it seems like the Trump campaign's legal arguments are incredibly inconsistent from state to state. I'm not an attorney, but you know, I don't, that seems like Rudy Giuliani kind of made up these qualms he has. And in, in it's his the league. same so, kind yeah. of word salad, you know, yeah. stuff. I mean, they're just trying to sow chaos and confusion and muddy the waters so that they can then come through and declare themselves the winners. And what's amazing is voters and the public, Republican leaders even have spoken up and said, that's not how it works. Yeah. And Biden's been ahead this whole time, whereas in 2000 in Florida, technically Bush was leading most of the time. So I think that's another big difference. It does help to have more electoral votes on the board. Back to those more ways to win. Yeah. And I think what you said, Monica, about sowing chaos and confusion, I think is the opposite of what we want in a president. I think that the last four years has been marked by installing fear in people in times where a president should be calming. Fingers crossed that the next four years will be featuring somebody who unites us and makes us feel comfortable about our situations. Couldn't agree more. And I think it does bode well for our future if we can just get through this. Sitting it out and waiting and It's hard, but it is so important to keep calm and keep counting the votes. I think the interesting thing is that what you're seeing is actually a rejection of that chaos. In a place like Maine, where Susan Collins was able to win, but Joe Biden prevailed in the state, clearly people had had enough of Trump because of some of the ways that he has behaved in office, quite certain of it. So if in the end, Biden wins like we think he will, like it looks like he will, I think a lot of it will be because of that chaos and confusion. People are tired of it. Which is very uplifting, I think, especially because the last four years have been so uncertain and this election has been so uncertain. Regardless of the outcome of this election, kind of to close out, how do you hope that climate policy will change and prevail in the next four years? And in general, what do you hope to see? I mean, it's not in terms of policy so much, but Monica made this point a little bit ago in that Trump was on the ballot this time. When Trump is not on the ballot, Democrats and people who want climate action are going to have to run on the issues because you're not going to have this boogeyman that we saw. I mean, maybe unless he wants to run again, but I don't want to put that out in the universe. But look, I think we're going to have to get better. And by we, I also include lawmakers, Democrats, especially at talking about climate change. And when you are giving an interview about the economy, mention climate change because the media will cover what lawmakers talk about. And if you get better practiced at incorporating the message of climate change into your regular rhetoric, I think that's where it starts to change because we saw in this election that the Green New Deal was not a winning issue for a lot of America. That's because it became so politicized. And and again, to Monica's point, labeled as socialism, labeled as government overreach, the government's gonna come in and take your cheeseburgers and your SUVs. And Democrats need to find a way to fight back against that narrative. And I know we started about jobs, right? Like it it is about jobs. And I think Joe Biden really set a good example of how you incorporate climate change into your economic message, into healthcare, even into national security. And Democrats need to do a much better job because if voters don't understand the importance of climate change and they don't hear their leaders and the people asking for their votes talk about this, like how do we expect them to care? I don't know. (laughs) Young people like you are going to make the difference because you care and that's going to bring it into the conversation as you all get farther and farther along in your careers and your lives and you care about the issue already it's going to have um, a bigger place in our political dialogue and that gives me a lot of hope 
a lot of hope. I would hope so. I can't speak for everyone in my age group, but I know that it's something that a lot of us are very passionate about and hope to change. And want to have careers in. I mean, I teach on the side. I teach at Georgetown University and my students care immensely about this issue and want to make it a part of their career, whether it's in national security or energy or government. They want to do this. They want to work on these issues because they understand the importance of them. And hopefully this election was a big civics lesson for all of us that we can't take elections for granted and down ballot races really matter. Mayoral races matter. The school board matters. Like what your kids are going to be learning in school is important. So I hope that we, you know, don't see a big slump in the midterms, I hope that people show up with this much passion to every election because, you know, as we saw the last four years, progress is really fragile and it can be undone by someone like Donald Trump. And there will be more Donald Trumps, whether it's Tom Cotton or Nikki Haley, people that aren't quite as unpalatable, but have a similar agenda. So it's like, we need to show up and know that progress takes a lot of work and it takes every generation doing their part. And we can't forget that. And we have to bring this voting passion every single freaking election. Mm -hmm. Everyone. I mean, Joe Biden has a record number of votes in history right now. So we can only yeah. hope that we can get more and more people to register to vote in future elections. I think this one mm -hmm. was special in that people felt very passionately about right. one, one candidate over the other. So I hope that this inspires people to feel like their vote matters because this election is so, so close. Yeah. And in 2016, Trump won by 70,000 votes. If you, if you really look down at the math and those were people that could have voted, but chose to stay home. And we got the past four years. So it just goes mm -hmm. to show everything is critical for a lot of the disappointing things we've seen. And, you know, Trump being elected into office, I am proud of the way in which most people have rejected this call by Trump that this election is invalid. We have to stop counting. I think that, you know, if we can still hold on to the notion that every vote matters, we have to count every vote. You know, I think that gives me a little bit of hope that we're, we're going to be Okay. <laughs> well, thank you both so much for you, taking the time to do this. I think more Best moderator ever. Like <laughs> thank you. I think this conversations like this need to be had more and I hope that we can do this more often live so everyone else can ask their questions cuz I know that that I've learned a lot working with our daily planet. I hope for many more opportunities to learn because it's opened my eyes to a lot of issues that I didn't know about previously and I really appreciate feeling informed. Thanks Zoe. Thanks, if everyone Zoe. wants to be informed from members of Congress and want to talk about mm -hmm. climate change more astutely to people that want to just learn more in general, go to ourdailyplanet.com and sign up for our free daily morning email.